Hello, and welcome to week two of Story of Christianity. Last week, we looked at the emergence of Christianity within the ancient Roman world and how this degenerated into a series of persecutions. Today, we're going to pick up that story, looking at two main themes. One, how did the relationship of Christianity change with respect to the empire? And some of the theological themes that were pertinent in these early years. So we're going to be moving here from the conversion of Constantine, the first Christian emperor, to the Council of Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, in 451, which was the definitive statement of the nature of Christ that would propel Christianity through the rest of its ages. So let's briefly look at what we're going to be doing today. We're going to begin with the conversion of Constantine, which brought an end to the persecutions within the Christian church, moving quite rapidly from a persecuted minority to the sponsored religion, and then eventually after Constantine to the state church. From there, we'll also look at the Christological or Trinitarian controversies. This involves a lot of issues of how to understand the relationship of Jesus to the Father and um, how to articulate this well. How is it that Christ can be both fully God and fully man? This is a very complicated subject, and we're going to be getting into a bit of minutia in several figures. But please track along and we'll see how this logically develops over time. We'll begin with the spark of the controversy and with the work of Arius and the response by Athanasius, and then move on to what's called conciliar Christology, looking at how the church came together to define its doctrine in response to various challenges of, uh, regarding the nature of Christ. So let's remind ourselves of the setting we're in. Christianity had spread throughout the Roman Empire by roughly 300, primarily through uh, its population in metropolitan areas. We see from this map that we looked at last time that there's large concentrations of Christians in North Africa, in Spain, in Asia Minor, in Italy, and especially in Egypt, which you can't see because I'm blocking it. But Christianity had bounced back from the brutal persecutions of the mid-3rd century under Dacius and had recently gone through the equally brutal persecution of Diocletian beginning in the early 4th century. However, all of these things would change quite rapidly with the ascension of a man named Constantine to the imperial throne. So let's back up and see how this occurred. Diocletian not only persecuted Christians, but he was trying to find a way to govern a very diverse and vast empire. So he came up with a, a, a scheme called the Tetrarchy. What this means is he broke up the Roman Empire into two parts, the Eastern and Western. These divisions will be very important for later uh, European history. And in these, he set two emperors, a Caesar and an Augustus. And each of these would have their own district within this rule. This would lead to a more, uh, a more responsive government with a more local leader who could govern and defend these areas, especially from uh, foreign invasion. However, the system would not last very long. Diocletian himself would retire quite rapidly and pass on his position to uh, his Caesar, Galerius. Now, in the West, this position was held by a man named Constantius, and his son would be Constantine. So let's, as you, he's the statue you can see above me. Constantine became co-emperor of the West after, in 306 after the death of his father. His father followed a fairly uh, common cult within the Roman Empire that worshipped the sun god. However, his mother, Helena, was a Christian and a very devout one, and taught the faith to her son from a young age. However, he did not come to this faith uh, rapidly, but in a moment of particular um, ecstatic experience, if you will. It was in 312, at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, that Constantine would secure his control over the entirety of the western half of the empire. And what happened before this would drastically turn the, the favor of Christianity and all of western history. The story goes that before the battle, Constantine is in his camp uh, and he's sleeping and he has a dream. And in that dream, he sees the battlefield and sees a crown. And he sees this sign that you can see above called the Cairo, which is the first two letters of Christ in Greek superimposed upon each other. It's an ancient Christian symbol. And the voice in the dream says, in this sign you will conquer. So the following day, abiding by this dream, Con Constantine paints the symbol of Christ upon the shields of his warriors, and he is victorious at Milvian Bridge. Immediately after, he legalizes Christianity in 313 with the Edict of Milan in both the Western 
and the Eastern Empire. He's in con consultation with the Emperor of the East at the time, although persecutions would sporadically continue in the East for some time. This marks a definitive turning point in the relationship between Christianity and the Empire, from a persecuted minority to the favored religion of the Emperor himself. Constantine would continue his push for full control of the Empire, becoming the, the sole Roman Empire in 324. Constantine's conversion to Christianity has uh, been rather controversial throughout the ages. Why did he do this? What were his motives? Was he actually converting, or was this some sort of Machiavellian ploy? Some people point to the fact that he's not baptized till much later in his life to show that this was not a genuine conversion. Um, it's, it's unclear whether or not that is the case. Some have seen this as the downfall of the pure church, leading to something generally called Constantinianism, or Christendom, in which the church is irrestricably linked with secular politics only to its corruption. Uh, this has been popularized in modern times by the Anabaptist tradition, specifically John Howard Yoder and uh, Stanley Hauerwas. However, the, the real issues are just much more complicated than that. You definitely could not tell a Christian in the 4th century that they were better off under the persecutions of Diocletian than they were in the legalized state of Constantine. This would be to mock their suffering and the real alleviation that they thought was providentially ordained. Whatever Constantine's personal motives, we know that politically he sought to unify the empire. In some ways, this wasn't that distinct from Diocletian's own goal, which was to unify the empire under the pagan religion. Constantine wanted Christianity to be a force of unity, of peace, and of solidarity amongst his people. Now, this did cause problems for the Christians beyond the pale of the Roman Empire making those Christians, especially in Persia, seem like a fifth column or a subversive element in the empire that was more loyal to Rome than to Persia itself. So this would have problems. However, it, this wasn't the best time for Constantine to pick such a horse to unify the empire because the church itself was riven by controversy. Seeking to overcome this, Constantine actually intervenes and calls church leaders together to resolve their differences, to come to a clear statement of the faith. And I think from my reading of Constantine on this, he genuinely did care for the truth of Christianity and was trying to preserve it the best he could. But there were unforeseen and unintentional consequences of this uh, close approximation of the Roman Empire and the Christian state. So let's look at those issues that uh, were causing problems within the church. Where did they come from and how um, were they resolved over a series of many years? <clears throat> This brings us to something that we could call the Christological controversy. So I just want to back up a moment to think about how does Christianity relate to an understanding of who Jesus is. In some ways, it is the most fundamental question that Jesus poses uh, to his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Christians of the early church wanted to confess truly the nature of Christ. These debates that we're going to be looking at um, they might seem a little technical. You might not always understand the clear point. Uh, I'll try to make that as clear as I can. But what needs to be foremost in our mind, that the early Christian theologians and bishops who were trying to sort out how to properly talk about Christ are doing so out of a sense of obedience. They want to hear the words of God through the scriptures and accurately speak about this God. This is an act of worship. Accurate speech and truthful confession of Christ is the hallmark of the Christian church. So we could put the question the early church was wrestling with this way. How could the church accurately and truthfully speak and think about Jesus and God in light of what the scriptures witnessed about him and the church's worship of him? So recall the most foundational fact of Christianity from its earliest period is the worship of Christ as God alongside the Father and the Holy Spirit. This worship preceded any abstract reflection on the theological warrant for such an act. This comes because of the experience of the apostles and the early Christians of the risen Christ. He had died on the cross, risen from the dead, and they worshipped him as the only Son of the Father. Now, this is a difficult teaching to understand. How is it that Christ is both fully God and fully man? It's not expressly spelled out in the New Testament, although these, both of these affirmations are clearly present. So the early church was trying to do theology, that is, to speak truthfully 
about who God is, who has he revealed himself to be, using every available ounce of faith and thought that we could, stopping where we must, but saying everything that scripture allows us and calls us to say about him. So we can think about this partially from a quote from the Bishop Hilary of Portier. He says, God is always prior to our thinking. What does he mean by this? He comes to this idea through reflections on the burning bush. You remember back in Exodus 3 where Moses approaches the bush that is burning but not consumed, and he speaks with God. God calls him to go back to Egypt and take his people out of slavery. But Moses does not know which name to come in, so he asks God, By what name shall I say that I'm coming? He says, I am. From this statement, which is where we get the ancient name for God, Yahweh, Hillary derived that God is being itself, beyond all creation. He defines himself. He names himself. Therefore, because God's existence and the Christ as the incarnation of God becomes prior to us and has um, priority over all of our thoughts, so God's existence must determine our thought, and we must not move into idolatry by projecting our own limited understandings onto the nature of God. And this was all done in an attempt to understand and faithfully exercise the worship of Christ on which the church was founded. So in an attempt to speak rightly about God, to understand Christ according to the word, the earliest Christians very early rejected two positions about the nature of Christ, which were seen as compromising his worship. The first of these was adoptionism. This position held that Jesus was a mere man who was anointed by the Holy Spirit like an Old Testament prophet, uh, but more so. Uh, he was therefore adopted by God at his baptism to preach the message of the kingdom. They would point to such places as John 1 and Philippians 2 that might indicate something like this. The early church rejected this because it is improper to worship anyone but God alone. If the adoptionists were correct, all early church worship was by nature idolatry. Just as those who would kneel down before Paul or Peter um, at their mighty acts were called idolaters and told to get up, much as John um, in Revelation is scolded for bowing down at an angel, all Christian worship, if adoptionism was true, would be a fundamental violation of the very first commandment. So this was quickly adopt, uh, rejected as completely inadequate to describe the truth of the New Testament, where the worship of Christ is clearly present and prescribed. But you could see the other extreme. So adoptionism stresses Christ as mere man. Another position called asceticism stresses that Christ was completely divine and he only appeared to be and do human things. So this word comes from dokein, which is the Greek word for to seem or to appear. In this position, all that we see in the New Testament in the Gospels, Christ walking around, eating, talking, thirsting, suffering in the garden, suffering on the cross, was merely a show. He is purely divine, and this was merely a manifestation of his activity. He is divine, and his human appearance and his human body were nothing but um, a temporary guys he put on to show humanity the way. This position was also rejected. The one who was worshipped by the Christians was not some sort of phantom, but was the man who was born of the Virgin Mary, who grew, who developed, who um, spoke in the temple, who ate, who thirsted, who cried, who suffered, who died. And this is very clearly set forth in the book of Hebrews, that he suffered in every way that he might be able to sympathize with us, that we might have a great high priest who is not ignorant of our pain and sorrow. So, doceticism is also rejected right out. Uh, you can see this also in 1 John, when he clearly says, anyone who denies that Christ has come into the flesh uh, is anathema, and many other places. So, these early bounds are being set. One cannot say he is just a human being, or that he just seemed to be a human being. So, Moving forward in how do we worship this God correctly? The earliest church, before the end of the persecution, was rather content to leave this uh, more or less vague. Theologians would give different accounts of this, um, but the exact terminology and exact way of talking about this were not always clear. Sadly, we don't have time to get into pre-Nicene Christology. 
One of the reasons that there had not been a unified uh, declaration on this was likely due to the persecutions. The theologians and bishops of the church could not really gather in one place when the threat of persecution was so high. Um, if you cut off the head, what would happen to the rest of the body? The major challenge to this kind of consensus of vagary came with the work of Arius. Sometimes in church history, when we talk about something called theological development, the ideas of the Bible being worked out in all their implications, what sparks this development is a negation of somebody coming out and saying, it is not this way. This forces the church to reflect on, we don't agree with that, that does not comport with how we worship Christ. Why is that the case? So theological development is often perpetuated by controversy. Regarding the person of Christ, this comes about by a man named Arius. Arius was born in 250, uh, somewhere in North Africa, probably Libya, and died about 336. He became a priest in Alexandria in Egypt and began to preach and write hymns that promoted his understanding of the relationship between God and Jesus. It's very important here that hymns were one of the main vehicles by which Arius got out his theology. Often it is more how we worship that forms our theology than the technical theology of textbooks. So be very attentive to what our hymns do say and what impressions they make on our people. So what was this understanding? It was such, it was such a position that open conflict began to break out between Arius and his bishop, Alexander of Alexandria, in 320. And it, this spark, this conflict between a bishop and one of his priests would engage the entire empire in a frenzied debate for almost six decades. So let's turn to see what was it that Arius taught that was so inflammatory and that caused such a ruckus. Arian's doctrine can be explained quite simply. He begins with a fundamental premise that we see from the Old Testament. There is only one God. That's pretty clear. Okay, This God is eternal and uncreated. Arius identifies the one and only eternal, uncreated, and unoriginated God with the Father. If this is the case, what must happen to the Son? The Son, in turn, is not a divine being in the strictest sense of being eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, uncreated, uh, without a beginning or end. Rather, rather the Son pre-exists his incarnation, but not as co-eternal with the Father. He is, rather, the highest of creatures. He was created before the rest of creation in order to be the agent of God. For this, Arius would point to places like Proverbs 8 in the discussion of wisdom there. Before the world was created, I was made, says Lady Wisdom personified there. Therefore, the Father is God, the uncreated. The Son is a divine-like being, but is created and has a beginning. There is a unity, according to Arius, between the Father and the Son. It's a unity of will. They want those same things, and it's a unity of activity. They seek to do the same things. Mostly the Father acts through the Son as his instrument. But they are not the same thing. They are not one in substance or essence. Substance or essence generally means that which makes something what it is and nothing else. Okay? So this can be summed up in a slogan that was used not exactly by Arius, but many of his followers, saying that there was a time when the Son was not. Okay? He came into being. Therefore, Christ is not God proper, but the highest creature whom the Father created. Why did Arius think this? There's three main reasons for Arius' rationale. First, he does work from Scripture. Arius focused on those texts that seem to indicate that the Son was subordinate to the Father, less than the Father. Particularly, this verse from John 14. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. But I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Jesus will also say many other things in the high priestly prayer in John, such as the Father and I are one. The church had to wrestle with how do these two types of statements go together? In what sense are God and God the Father and Christ one? And in what sense can we say that Jesus is less than the Father? It was this scriptural tradition in which Arius is trying to make sense of. But it wasn't just this. He also was working from previous tradition in Christian writing, specifically some work done by Origen, who we mentioned last time, who often emphasized the separateness of the Father and the Son. This was mostly to uh, do justice to the nature of the 
the New Testament narrative, in which the Father and the Son are not just one. They are not just undifferentiated unity. Otherwise, uh, we would get something called Sabellianism, in which the unity of God is such that when we see Christ praying to the Father or the Spirit acting, uh, all we're seeing is different masks of the same God. This was rejected very early on as well. So Arius would point to these elements in the tradition to support his claim. He's saying, I'm not saying anything new. I'm in line with scripture, and I'm in line with the previous fathers. However, the main impetus between, behind Arius' ideas, I think, is his use of the philosophical tradition of Neoplatonism. He uses this to support his case for the created nature of the Son. So we need to back up a second and understand this tradition. So the Neoplatonist tradition works on a fundamental idea of the great chain of being. Okay, this goes back to the philosopher Plato, and it's updated in later centuries by people like Plotinus and Porphyry. In this understanding, we have the One. The One emanates out creation itself, the realm of um, angelic beings, the realm of man, the realm of woman, which in this philosophy is less than man, very different than Christianity, which affirms the image of both. Under the sentient beings, or sorry, under the conscious beings, we have the sentient beings like animals, and then plants, and then minerals. There is this continu continuity from full being or existence through down to gradations to non-being itself, which would be defined as evil. Arius combines this with the Judaic understanding of the creator-creature distinction. So unlike Plot uh, Plotinus and other Neoplatonic philosophers, God is not seen in a continuity between himself and the created order. God does not bubble up to create. God does not descend into what is being. Rather, God, who is completely uncreated and independent and free, creates from nothing. There is a fundamental qualitative difference between God and his creation. God has no beginning and no end. He is divine. He is, in some older ways of saying it, being itself. He is the perfect one in triune unity. We see this, uh, we see this separation of creator and creature uh, shot through the Old and New Testament. There is God, and then there is everything else, and there is no separating that boundary. So, Arius takes this idea from the Bible of the creator-creature distinction, applying it to the uh, Neoplatonic concept of the great chain of being. This gives a question. On which side of the line ought Christ to be placed? Is he on the side of the creator or on the side of creation? Arius stressed that God himself must be one, must not have any differentiation in him. Therefore, the Son is not divine not divine, at least in the proper sense, but is an agent of creation and the one who forms the world at the behest of the eternal God. We could image Arius' uh, position quite like this. So we have God the Father, the only one who is uncreated. He then creates God the Son, who then creates God the Spirit, maybe together, it's a little vague on that, and these three create the world. So, the fundamental line is, the Father is creator, the Son is created. This flies in the face of the Christian understanding of the worship of Christ. Because remember, we are monotheists, we only worship God. Anything else is idolatry, as the Old Testament clearly says. So, the Orthodox, those who came to oppose Arius, saw this as challenging the very foundational pillar on which Christianity is built, that Christ is the one who is to be worshipped. One of the main proponents to argue against uh, Arius is a man named Athanasius, who we saw last time with reference to the canon. Athanasius was Egyptian by birth and Greek by education. He is um, an extremely uh, well-read and um, clear-thinking father. He himself attended Nicaea, which we'll get to in a second, as a non-voting observer uh, as kind of a secretary to Alexander of Alexandria. <clears throat> After the council, Athanasius was the key proponent of Nicene Orthodoxy against the Ar Arian party, and would suffer greatly for this. He would write several works against the Arian heresy, and lay forth his argument on why this understanding of Christ as not fully divine, is insufficient to account for the biblical witness, is insufficient to account for worship, and is most importantly, 
um, maybe not most importantly, but as importantly, unable to account for human salvation because the incarnation itself is so that Christ could be the salvation of humanity, bringing them back to the eternal father. This opposition to Arius would cost Athanasius much. In his effort to support Nicaea, uh, which we'll explain more in a second, he is exiled five times. And this has led to the phrase of Athanasius Contramundum, that at points it felt as if the only one trying to uphold this doctrine was Athanasius himself, and he was dogged with it, and we should rejoice in that fact. The reason that he was exiled so many times, as the various emperors went back and forth on which horse they were going to back in this debate. Constantine, as we'll see, initially and continued to back the Nicene party, but his children and other following emperors would switch back and forth and support Arians or what are called semi-Arian parties. So this whole debate gets wrapped back up in what we saw of the Christian empire. How is this all going to work out? So let's turn to why Athanasius argues against Arius so fully. I can't give his full argument here uh, because it would be quite lengthy, but I would recommend to you his work on the incarnation. This work is written before the Arian controversy breaks out, but most of his logic that he will use to uh, refute Arian teachings are present therein. Uh, the version I have up there is probably the most helpful to read. Athanasius works off three different premises on why Christ must be fully God. So he says the word must uh, become incarnate in order to take the death that humanity deserves for their sins and overcome it. Okay, so. Humanity has a fundamental problem. We're sinful. Our first parents fell. We continually reject the word of God. We live however we want. We um, continue to sin and get debt, um, guilt, shame. How can we overcome this? Well, who do we owe? We owe God. Can any other creature pay back a debt that is so infinite against the creator of the universe? Athanasius, followed by much of the later Western tradition, will say no. Such a debt, such a infinite debt of sin and shame and guilt that we continually move into can never be overcome by a fellow creature because to violate the will of the creator is cosmic rebellion. Therefore, if we are going to be saved, God himself, the word, must take on humanity so that he can take what our sins deserve and overcome it. That he, that our human nature itself can be united to God in the closest possible way. And therefore our sin might be overcome. So the word must become fully human in order to save us. He goes more than this. The word must come to restore the image of God in humanity. He uses an image here. So imagine there is a great portrait um, and it somehow gets marred. How will it ever be restored to its proper image? Athanasius says, are you going to just scrape everything off and start over from memory? You probably wouldn't get much closer to the image than the marring. No, the man who was the, whose portrait it was must come back and sit to have it repainted. So it is with the image of God. Humanity is created in God's image to show forth his glory in this world as their vice as God's vice regents. And because we've sinned, our image is marred. Therefore, God himself, the original image, must come to reestablish it. So in the Son taking to himself a full human nature, he reestablishes and reforms the image of God in which humanity was always necessary, in the form in which it was originally intended, that of God himself. The third point that Athanasius connects to is the idea of revelation. And this comes to this idea that only God can make himself known. Human reason or effort cannot ascend up to understand God in and of himself. Even though God's word is clear, even though his uh, countenance is seen in the world he has created to some extent, as we see in the Psalms and elsewhere, if we are going to truly know God, only God can do it. If we're, only, if we're going to truly know God, then through Jesus Christ, Christ must be God himself. So the word of God takes to himself a human nature so that he could fully reveal the Father and who God truly is. Therefore, 
Athanasius says the Arius falls on several points. If Jesus is a created being, we do not have reunion with God because God has not saved us. If Christ is a created being, our image is still marred, or it's in the image of something else other than God, some created being. And if Christ is not God, we do not truly know God, for only God can reveal himself. So this is the rationale that Athanasius puts forward against Arius, and these ideas will be taken up at the Council of Nicaea and affirmed by the entire church. So let's turn to that council now. So the council is called in 325 by Constantine himself, trying to bring unity to this church, and this leads to some complications. Because it's called by the emperor, how do the church and state relate here? Who has higher authority in doctrine? And as I said, with Athanasius' later life, this will be in conflict from there for from quite some time. But at Nicaea, 300 bishops or so gather, and they're from all out the empire and many from without, especially Persia, Armenia, and um, some Syrian bishops also. And this is got from May 20th to July 25th. And these bishops gather to debate this doctrine. Is Arius right or not? Out of this debate is produced what is called the Creed of Nicaea, or the Nicene Creed. And the hinge of this whole document is this simple word, that Jesus is homoousios, or of the same substance with God the Father. Jesus is homoousios with God the Father. This is what the Creed looks like, and I'm sure you've seen a version of it before. That, uh, And notice how this is bringing up the rule of faith in the Apostles' Creed that we've previously seen. The rule of faith is being updated to exclude positions that were not previously clearly defined away. Arius could say, I can still affirm the Apostles' Creed because it doesn't say exactly that Jesus was fully one with the Father, both divine. So, look especially here into how this is done. It says, we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth. So there's several ways that the conciliar follow, uh, fathers are working here to establish the identity of Jesus. We see one, this is framed, it will go on to mention the Holy Spirit, in the same Trinitarian form as the ancient rule of faith. And Jesus is called Lord, indicating his union with the Father, who is also Lord. He is distinguished as the only begotten Son of the Father, showing a unique relationship here. The three phrases that go on from there attempt to show this relationship. He is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. What this means is that Christ is from the Father in such a way that he is exactly the same thing. As, um, so there's a metaphor here, as human parents will have a human child. So God who has a son is fully God. Now, don't think of this as a small g um, gods of paganism that are um, just kind of local deities with emotions, with beginnings. No, we're talking here about God, the creator of all things, who is uncreated, infinite, holy, majestic, independent of everything else. And the council is saying that the Father is this, uncreated, holy, good, free, dependent on nothing. The Son is simultaneously good, infinite, free, dependent on nothing. And yet, they are one substance. They are the same thing. They are both God. And therefore, they draw this distinction. The Son is begotten. He is not made. Okay? You could put it this way. He is not created. There is a relationship that is eternal between the Father and the Son. Because one cannot be a father unless they have a son, right? There's no way the Father could be Father before the Son existed. And therefore, this relationship, this eternal relationship between Father and Son, which is trying to be encompassed by this word begotten, using the special sense, is eternal. There was never a time when the Son was not. The, there was never a time when the Father was not Father or when the Spirit was not there as well. We'll talk about that in a second. Nicaea is saying something quite radical, and uh, which is trying to get at what is the New Testament doing when 
we worship Christ, when it calls the Father one, when it calls Jesus Son, what does it mean? What the conciliar fathers are saying is that they are one in the sense that they are both fully divine. They share in the same essence. Whatever it is that makes God God, they both have. And they have an eternal relation such that the Father is Father and the Son is Son. You can define that some ways in to be vague as they are not the same and yet they are one. So the Father and Son are distinct but unified in substance. And they also do the same things. Notice the statement that the Father is the maker of all things, and it is by whom, it is by Christ, all things were made, as is said repeatedly throughout the New Testament. So, the same act of creation is predicated of Father and Son. Therefore, if Christ is a thing made, he would make himself, which would reject Arianism again. In this, the Nicene tradition establishes firmly the unified nature of Father and Son, and they reject the position of Arius. So the Nicene Creed goes on to have anathemas, rejecting those who say, there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, or he is of another substance or essence, or the Son of God is created, or changeable or alterable. They are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So not only does the Nicene tradition say father and son are both God eternally, but anyone who rejects this must be removed from the church. So this was a great step forward in understanding of Christian doctrine. However, it would not come without a price. This doctrine would not be immediately acknowledged by all the church, partially because of the use of non-scriptural language to describe this relationship, there was debate over the nature of homoousios, what exactly is an ousia, an essence, um, and there was debate on how that word was understood in Latin translation versus the Greek, and we'll get into a little bit that in a second. One brief excursus, just for fun. So, somebody you know was at Nicaea, and that would be good old Saint Nick, but not the one you see in the picture above me with the fluffy beard and the red hat, but the actual St. Nicholas, who was a bishop in Asia Minor. He was renowned for his generosity in giving gifts to the poor. And the legend says, and this is definitely a legend because Arius was not at the council, that, um, that Santa Claus, if you will, slapped Arius in the face for denying the divinity of Christ. So you should put that on your Christmas list and know which side you're on there. All right, moving on from that brief excursus, which just amuses me. All right, let's define our terms a little more clearly. So the essence of Nicaea is the term homoousios, of the same substance. So let's define this term, ousia. Ousia means being, reality, essence, or substance. Put in a different way, one's ousia is that which makes you, you, sorry, that which makes you the thing you are and not any other thing. So human essence would be that which makes a person human and not anything else, distinguishing you from everything else. Your humanness, that which all human beings share, that unites them. Okay. So when we're talking about the usia of God, this is a unique nature. Remember the creator-creature distinction. There is only one divine usia. It is not a genre of which more things than one can engage in. Okay. And the prefix homo means the same. So the council says that Christ is homoousia of the Father, of the same substance. Whatever the Father is, Christ is as well, fully, completely, with no differentiation of being. This is distinguished from a lesser term that was used by some of the, the opponents of Nicaea, and that is the term homoousia. Homoi meaning similar or like. So this lesser position, called the Hamoian position, would say that Jesus is like the Father, like in substance, similar in substance, but does not define it more fully than that. Nicene theologians and Athanasius among them said this does not go far enough. It is not good enough that we have a God-like thing save us, a God-like thing tell us who God is, a God-like thing restore the image of God. Christ must be fully God incarnate. Okay. This is the, in some ways, revolutionary idea of Nicaea that is confirming and establishing the truth of the worship of Christ that begins from the early period. This is guarding the church against um, a, a very dangerous heresy that would lead us away from the worship of Christ as a God, 
and an understanding of the unity of the divine person into something else entirely. So we can begin to show, see how Christology is setting up in this period. I'm calling this the road of Nicene Orthodoxy. So it's helpful to understand Christ, uh, Christology as having ditches of error that must be avoided to stay in the middle path. Okay? So the middle path of Nicaea is that Christ is fully God and fully human. There is an error on one side that would compromise his humanity, such as we saw with Doceticism, that would reject his humanity as real and as merely an appearance. On the other side, we have the ditch of compromising his divinity. We saw this already in Adoptionism, which claims that Christ is only a mere, a mere man who was adopted by the Father. That was rejected very early. In addition in this ditch is placed Arianism, that Christ is only the highest creature. Therefore, the truth about Christ that allows us to worship him must fall in this main road between compromising his divinity and compromising his humanity. Okay, so Nicaea has quite a bit of fallout. There was dispute over the Declaration of the Council, um, and it, this lasted for roughly 60 years thereafter. Was this the right way to say this? Was there a better way? Was it right for us to go beyond the words of Scripture to affirm this? Over many debate, uh, it was seen that it was. In the Council of Constantinople, the first council, uh, in 381, this was all reaffirmed, uh, kind of bringing this initial stage of the controversy to an end. Constantinople I dealt with two additional problems. Now, notice what Nicaea does. It emphasizes very hard the divinity of Christ. Now, as humans are, when you emphasize one of two things, you're likely to down, downplay the other. And so, after Nicaea, the integrity of Christ's humanity started to be called into question by certain teachings. We'll look at those in a second. Constantinople also dealt with the deity of the Holy Spirit, which was not uh, expressly discussed in the Nicene Creed, the initial one, because that, that wasn't the topic at hand. The real point was the divinity of the Son. So let's take these in turn. The challenge to Christ's humanity comes primarily through the teaching of a man named Apollinaris of Laodicea, who... Uh, is present from 310 to 390. Apollinaris was a friend of Athanasius and a very staunch anti-Arian. However, he pushed the case for the full divinity of the Logos so far that he compromised the human nature itself. So according to Apollinaris, the Logos assumed a body that had a basic life-giving soul, but not a heart, higher spiritual or rational soul, a mind or a noose. So, you have to understand what Apollinaris is saying here. We must understand a, uh, a basic uh, Greco-Roman tripartite understanding of humanity. So, human beings, according to a lot of ancient thought, had three parts. We have our body, our physical part. We have our soul, our animus, which is that which gives us life in motion. We share this with animals, right? So, there's something about animals. They can move, they can think, they can act on instinct. So, humans also have that. We are animated. But humans have something that animals do not. We have a mind, we have reason, we can think. And this was called pneuma in most of these views of the human person. So what Apollinaris said is, okay, this is how we can slot this in. He's fully divine, and he takes to himself a human body and a human animating soul. And he plugs into that, the Logos becomes the mind, the rational soul of Christ. So, you see in this, though, there's part of the human being that Jesus doesn't have. He has a human body, he has a human animating soul, but he lacks a human mind or higher soul. This is a problem. If you think back to the logic of salvation as worked out by Athanasius, you might already see why. Christ was to remake the whole image. Well, what about our mind? What about our reason? To answer the challenge of Apollinarianism, um, comes the people called the Cappadocian Fathers, Basil, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of Nazianzus. And, uh, Basil and Gregory of Nyssa were actually brothers. These uh, men were all kind of around the same area of Cappadocia and were some of the most important theologians of the 4th century and proponents of Nicene Orthodoxy against Apollinaris and others. Um, the importance of these three really can't be stressed enough. Um, their sister was also very important, Macarena, who uh, helped raise them and was a 
a nun in her own right and a theologian in her own right. So they will lead the charge after Athanasius for the doctrine of Nicaea. And they especially will reject Apollinarianism. So let's look at what Gregory of Nazianza says here. He says, The unassumed is the unhealed, but what is united with God is also being saved. Had half of Adam fallen, what was assumed and is being saved would have been half too. But if the whole fell, he is united to the whole of what was born and is being saved wholly. Okay, let's break that down a little bit. What is Nazianza saying here? What's the problem with Apollinarianism? Well, he takes us back to the fall. If humanity had only fallen in part, then maybe the human nature could only be in part. If it was only our body that was the issue, or the animating soul, or our mind, or our will, um, then maybe that's all the Logos, the eternal Son, needed to take to restore our image. But however, that's not the case. Everything about us has been marred by sin. Um, we will later see this doctrine in the Protestant Reformation era called total depravity. Every part of human, the human being has been marred by sin. Therefore, Christ, in order to redeem all of humanity, not leaving any untouched by his saving power, must assume it all. So this is a basic axiom um, from here on out of Christology. The unassumed is unhealed. Therefore, Christ must have a full human nature if he is going to redeem the whole of human nature. So responding to this, Nazianzus continues, We affirm and teach one and the same God and Son, at first not man, but alone and pre-eternal, unmixed with body and all that belongs to the body, but finally human being too, assumed for our salvation, the same passable in flesh, impassable in Godhead, bounded in body, boundless in spirit, earthly and heavenly, visible and known spiritually, finite and infinite, so that by the same whole man and God, the whole human being fallen under sin might be fashioned anew. I think that's an amazing passage in which he's saying what we need, what we must need if we're going to return to God, know him fully, love him fully, be remade into what we were meant to be, the image of God. God himself, the eternal son who is unified with the father in spirit, must take to himself our humanity while keeping the distinction clear. Remember, the creator-creature distinction is paramount here. He is bounded in body, yet boundless in spirit. He is finite and infinite and in one. Now, this is a great mystery, and I hope that we see that. When we're talking about the incarnation, we're not trying to nail down Christ in such a way that we can uh, examine him um, by mathematical means, but it's trying to wrestle with what does the scripture actually say about Christ? It says he is God, and it tells us who God is, and it says he is a human being completely and to the hilt, with sin only accepted. This is what the early fathers are trying to wrestle with, and that's why Nazianzus is pushing so hard against Apollinaris and supporting Nicaea. He must be fully human, so that we might be reunited fully to God. All right, so this all comes to a head at the Council of Constantinople I in 381. The Nicene position on homoousios is reaffirmed. The creed is slightly rewritten. That's why the creed that you normally think of as the Nicene Creed is properly called the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Niceno Creed. If you see the difficulty of saying it is why we don't call it that. Um, all Polinarius is rejected. All of human being, all of the human being is taken into Christ. And there's also a more clearer statement on the divinity of the Holy Spirit. This is to make the creed much more appropriate for a full rule of faith, um, because this was left out as just because it wasn't really the main consideration at Nicaea. It's also to reject a group called the Pneumatomachians, um, one of my favorite heretical names. It means those who fight against the spirit or the spirit fighters. Um, the Cappadocians were also instrumental in rejecting this, showing that it is not just the Son who is homoousios, but the Spirit is as well. This is the clear definition of we have to understand this in Trinitarian forms. What was implicit um, beforehand is now made explicit, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all unified in the same Godhead and are to be worshipped as Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, yet three persons. So let's update our Christological ditches here. So we see that we can add an error in the ditch of compromising humanity, that is Apollinarianism, which claims that Christ has no human mind 
or higher soul. So you see what's happening here is that the church is narrowing in the right understanding of Christ by negation. Okay, that position doesn't work. It compromises salvation. That position doesn't work. It compromises his divinity. That position doesn't work. It compromises humanity. And through this process of narrowing, a clearer picture of the person of Christ and therefore the work of Christ come into view. So let's move forward after Constantinople to see what happens next. After the Arian controversy and the refutation of Apollinarianism, early theologians had, to arrive, had arrived at a firm understanding of Christ's relationship uh, with reference to God and humanity. So he is fully God and fully man. He is homoousios with God the Father and the Spirit, one substance or being. And he is at the same time, because of the incarnation, homoousios with us. Everything that we are in our essence, he is too. He's united these things. However, there is a question that remains. How does the divinity and humanity relate in Christ? So he's fully God, he's fully man. That's established after Constantinople. Everyone agrees. How? How do we articulate this unity? How do we make sense of it? Okay. To turn to that, we're going to look at the next stage in the Christological controversy, which begins with a debate between a man named Cyril of Alexandria and Nestorius of Constantinople. And this will lead up to the Council of Ephesus, and from there, the Council of Chalcedon. So, let's begin by explaining some of the dynamics that were emerging after, <clears throat> after Constantinople into the 5th century. We have two schools developing around the centers of Antioch and Alexandria. So, the early church, as I said, developed more hierarchical bishops, and of those bishops, five became most important. These are called the five patriarchs. We have a patriarch of Alexandria, of Jerusalem, of Antioch, of Constantinople, and of Rome. And generally, these five are seen on par with one another. However, we also have different centers of intellectual engagement and theological development. And the two poles of the ancient world in some ways can be summed up with Alexandria and Antioch, which took different approaches to various aspects of the Christian faith. One of the approaches was their interpretation of scripture. Alexandria, following after Clement of Alexandria, Origen, um, followed a very um, allegorical method of interpreting scripture. So the literal sense of the text was generally downplayed, and a spiritual sense was uh, sought for, behind the words, through the words, if you will. Antioch, on the other hand, focused much more on the literal sense of the text and rejected what they called fanciful allegories. Um, in some ways, you can see this tension later between Protestants and Catholics. But the part that's most important to us right now is their emphasis on Christ. In Alexandria, following after Origen, there was much more emphasis on the divinity of Christ and his unity. You can see why that would be especially important after Arianism. Arius was a teacher in Alexandria, and the hometown wants to really distance themselves from that heresy. So they focus very much on his divinity, but in some ways they lower the importance of humanity. They focus on how the humanity didn't suffer, didn't thirst, didn't hunger. Antioch didn't like this. Antioch focused much more on the humanity of Christ, the reality of his hunger, the reality of his thirst, the reality of him taking all of human nature. But in so doing, in some ways, they began to separate the human and divine nature. At this point, these are just tendencies. But these tendencies are going to... Uh, kind of get out of hand as a controversy develops between a representative of the Antiochene school and the Alexandrian school. Turning to that, we need to talk about Nestorius. So Nestorius was uh, a member of the Antiochene tradition who became bishop of Constantinople. Okay, so the church is made of humans. Humans are petty. The church has politics. The Alexandrians are not that happy that a member of the rival school has gotten gotten another of the patriarchs okay so they're they're already predisposed to dislike antioch and this move of nestorius to antioch is not probably good for them um, and it should be said that the issues between nestorius and cyril were not purely theological both men could be stubborn and um could do immoral things to support their position the church is not um is not always living up to our moral commands, as you rightly know. So Nestorius comes to Constantinople, and he begins to teach uh, in the Alexandrian mode. 
emphasizing the distinctiveness of the divinity and the humanity of Christ. We already see kind of how you could get there from Nazianzus' statement. He is infinite and finite at the same time. He is bound yet everywhere. So emphasizing that these both must be true. Okay? However, controversy would ignite when uh, Nestorius denied the appropriateness of calling the Virgin Mary Theotokos, or God-bearer, or Mother of God, which was part of the liturgical celebration, uh, in some ways honoring Mary, calling her the Mother of God. So why did Nestorius say this? Well, let's see what he says. They even dared to treat of the Christ-bearing Virgin in a way as as along with God, for they do not scruple to call her Theotokos, when the holy and beyond all praise fathers of Nicaea said no more of the Holy Virgin than our Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, not to mention the scriptures, which everywhere, both by angels and apostles, speak of the Virgin as mother of Christ, not of God the Word. So what's Nestorius doing here? Why is he being, why is he rejecting this term? So for him, what he thinks is going on here, this term is inappropriate. Mary, as a human woman who bore Christ, did not bear his divine nature. A human mother cannot give birth to a divine son in the strictest sense, right? She can give birth to a human. This is how things work. Therefore, it is understood by Nestorius that the, the word is born of Mary in his human nature, not his divinity. Because otherwise it would, according to how Nestorius is thinking about this, this would imply that the mother precedes the son, right? The mother always exists before the son. If you call Mary mother of God, you're almost implying that she exists before God himself. So he didn't like this term. He thought it was imprecise, and he thought it unduly caused confusion about Christ. No, this isn't really about Mary. This is about how do we understand Christ. So he would grant an understanding of Theotokos. Uh, there's a sense you could say, it, but the term could be accepted in consideration of this, he says, that the word is used of the virgin only because of the inseparable temple of God, the word which was of her, not because she is the mother of God, the word, for none gives birth to one older than herself. Okay, so we see in this, Nestorius is distinguishing the natures, trying to make a distinction between Mary bears the human Christ, not the divine Christ. I, I'm holding back some language here because you can see where the confusion might happen. There needs to be some more conceptual categories going on. And especially this causes problems because it's messing with liturgical formations, which is likely to cause debate. It's not like this is something he's saying and writing off here in the corner, but he's changing the liturgy of Constantinople, the capital of the Roman Empire, after Constantine moved the empire, the, the capital there from Rome. So let's uh, see if we can understand Nestorius' Christology a bit with this diagram here. I do apologize for some of the technical terms, but um, you can't really understand the ins and outs of this debate without them. So Nestorius says that there are two usias, as we've said, homoousia with the Father, homoousia with humanity. So there is the divine nature, the divine usia, and the human usia. Now, this is where Nestorius goes a little off. There is therefore two hypostasis, or persons, because according to uh, Nestorius, an usia must have a hypostasis, or personhood, or an instantiation. It's hard to know exactly what these terms mean. The terms hypostasis, and nature, and usia, and we'll see here prosopone, um, are used in different ways by different theologians, and I, they're not always necessarily consistent with themselves. So part of this Christological debate is a formalization of terminology. When we say this word, this is what we mean. We don't mean that. And that would also cause issues between the Greek-speaking east of the empire and the Latin-speaking west. So this is what Nestorius taught, that Christ has both a divine usia and human usia, a divine hypostasis and a human hypostasis, and these are joined at conception to produce a single prosopone. Okay? Now, we need to make a distinction then about how these terms hypostasis and prosopone were generally understood. The term hypostasis, as at least as it would later clearly become affirmed, it's unclear if Nestorius held this, but hypostasis generally means the answer to who that is. Okay. So if in nature, if we look at something and we say, what is that? That's a question of nature. What sort of thing is that? Okay. What category of things does that belong in? However, the question to who 
that is, is a question of person. Or the question of whose that is, is one of person. Okay, So this is what's going on. Hypostasis generally means the who of an entity. Prosopone is more in appearance. Okay, Prosopone initially came from the word for mask in the theater. Okay, so it's about presentation. Now that word will morph into what we understand as person or personality. Um, but at this time, there's a dis difference here. So theologians thought that Nestorius was saying that there are two usia, two, pros two hypostasis, but only one prosopone. Okay, so let me see if I can break that down. What Nestorius was saying seems to be that there are Christ is divine, and a divine person, and a human person, and their unity is in appearance only. Okay, So th this is going to be a problem. It's unclear whether Nestorius meant to say this. Uh, he might just have been sloppy in his words. But this gives rise to a new position or heresy called Nestorianism. And from my study reading Nestorius, especially after the Council of Chalcedon, uh, where he says, this is what I was trying to say all along. I do not think Nestorius himself fell into this error, but this error is a recognizable ditch or fall of um, Christological discussions. So Nestorianism is the Christological error or heresy that denies the unity of the human, humanity and divinity of Christ, creating two separate persons designated generally Jesus and Christ, or two Christs. Okay. So their unity is only that of maybe action, maybe will, uh, maybe coincidence. Okay. There is not a unity that goes deeper than that. Um, some would, uh, and Cyril, who we'll look at in a second, would compare Nestorius's teaching to the unity of two boards nailed together or glued together rather than something deeper. Okay. So keep that in mind. Nestorianism is the teaching that would separate out two persons in Christ. But it is unclear whether or not Nestorius himself held to this teaching. So, after his rejection of the Theotokos language and this possible separation of the two usia of Christ, uh, this position is very much opposed by Cyril of Alexandria, who is not only opposed to Nestorius um, in theological realms coming from the Alexandrian rather than the Antiochian school, but also politically. And there's various wranglings with the imperial court that I'll pass over. But he challenged Nestorius and said that what he's arguing for results in two different Christs. There is the divine Christ, and then there is the human Christ. And they don't have any real unity together. Cyril would work on this through several letters, and his thought does develop over time. But we can point to him for two very key kind of discussions. The two natures discussion and the hypostatic union. Although, how exactly he uses these terms are ambiguous, but they'll become very important in Christological discussions from here on out. So let's see how Cyril defines this union. So he says, So confessing the word united hypostatically, according to person, to flesh, we worship one Son and Lord Jesus Christ, neither putting apart and dividing the man and God as joined with each other by a union of dignity and authority, for this would be an empty phrase, and no more. Nor speaking of the word of God separately as Christ, and then separately of him who was of a woman as another Christ, but knowing only one Christ, the word of God, the, the word of God the Father, with his own flesh. Okay, so what is Cyril saying here? The union of the divine and human in Christ cannot be seen as something... Um, outside of him, some weak bond, but it must be at its deepest root. And if you think back to that logic of salvation we talked about with Athanasius, you'll see why. If it is necessary for Christ to become incarnate, the word of God himself come to take our flesh, he must really take it. It really must be his. It must be fully united to him in a real sense. Okay, And what Cyril sees in the story is doing is separating that out. There, there's only a union of what he says here, dignity and authority, meaning that we treat them the same and we listen to them the same. So the unity that he sees in the story is, is only one of our subjective reaction to Christ, not the reality that's there. So that's a problem. We need Christ to be who he really is, fully God and fully man, united for us.
And the worry here is something like uh, two minds separated, that there is just no real connection between Christ and his humanity. Okay, so we'll, we'll see how this goes for, uh, as we go on. Because of what he sees as errors in Nestorius' teaching, Cyril writes um, in what is called his second letter to Nestorius, very firm rejections of Nestorius' position. He says, if anyone does not confess that Emmanuel is God in truth, and therefore the Holy Virgin is Theotokos, for she bore the flesh, the word of God became, so for she bore in the flesh, the word of God become flesh, let him be anathema or rejected by the church. If anyone does not confess that the word of God the Father was united by hypostasis to flesh, and is one Christ with his own flesh, that is the same both God and man together, let him be anathema. So we see what Cyril's doing here with Theotokos. According to Cyril, um, Mary can be called mother of God because she bore the flesh of God. Okay, So he's not saying what Nestorius worried about, that by calling her mother of God, we were saying something about God uh, coming after Mary or Mary producing the divinity as if there's another birth. Rather, he's saying it is appropriate to call her the mother of God because the one she bore was, in fact, God. And it is for this reason that um, the church follows clearly in this, that Theotokos is appropriate because the one who was born was both God and man. But it is not that she bore his divinity, but the one she bore was God. Okay, We'll, we'll kind of work out some of that in a bit. And he also introduces much firmer this dis distinction of hypostasis as the unifying factor between the two natures, okay? And you can see, if you look back at how Nestorius sorted that out, this would cause a problem. Nestorius is saying two hypostasis, Cyril is saying one. And so it's unclear if they're using them in the same way, but this is where the rub lies. However, Cyril's own position has some issues as well. Let's look at how we might describe it. So much like Nestorius, there are two usia, the divine and the human. These are united into a single hypostasis, single person, the answer to who. However, there's a bit of undifferentiation. How does this hypostatic union work, this union of person? N N Cyril will generally talk about this coming from two natures, okay? That Christ is God and man from two natures. So one hypostasis from two natures. Now think about that for a second. What might that imply? What might be the issue if we talk about a single person from two natures? Hold on to that. We'll get to it in a second. Okay, so how does this all go down? In order to uh, resolve the dispute between uh, Nestorius and Cyril, a council is called at Ephesus in 431. Cyril leads the charge against Nestorius. Okay, he's there. He's coming to charge Nestorius with heresy, with failing to preserve the unity of Christ's person. However, Cyril is kind of a... Okay, frankly, Cyril's kind of like a mob boss type guy. He gets his way, and he'll, you know, have guys come rough you up if you, you don't pay attention. But in all fairness, Nestorius could be that way too. Um, and clay feet and all. So Cyril kicks off the proceedings before many representatives who were sympathetic to Nestorius' concerns came to the council. He kicks it off, and the, especially those from Rome and from the Syrian churches, who while they didn't agree with Nestorius and everything, they saw his point, and they were trying to figure out how can we say this better. So Cyril gets the council going, gets them to condemn Nestorius' teaching, and proclaim Cyril's in the proper line with Nicene Orthodoxy. Okay. So Cyril wins this, but this causes resentment with those who thought Nestorius was not a heretic and who was trying to say um, careful things. This leads to a breach um, in, the, in the East between um, those who accept the Council of Ephesus and those who don't. Those who don't will be called Nestorians. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a second. Okay. Nestorius himself is exiled and flees. So Cyril seems to have won the day. However, there is more to be said. The debate between Cyril and Nestorius forced the church to define more exactly the relationship between Christ's divinity and humanity. Ephesus dealt with one error that had to be avoided, separating Christ's divinity and humanity to the point where the union was merely verbal 
or subjective on our part, where we see the unity in how we act towards them, not in their very substance. However, as we saw, Cyril's own view left open another ditch of not properly distinguishing the natures and combining them. It would be this error that would come next, something that would need to be addressed. Okay, so this is leading us up to the declaration of Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, I say both. Okay, so following after Cyril's teaching, um, a priest in Constantinople, sorry, he's an abbot, an abbot in Constantinople begins to push Cyril's teaching very hard, saying that Christ is from two natures and is now a new nature. Okay, he took to uh, Cyril's teaching so far that Christ results in a tertium quid. Okay. You might not know that term, obviously. Tertium quid is Latin for a third thing. Neither God nor man, but something else entirely. Now, if you think back to one of our fundamental principles of Christian theology, there exist only two things. God, who is uncreated, perfect, eternal, and he is God. And then his creation, which is contingent, finite, etc. There cannot be a third thing. There is either the creator or the creature. Christ is creator and has become creature through the incarnation, not something else. So Eutyches um, pushes this unity so far that the natures begin to mix. So uh, Alois Grillmeyer puts it this way. He's one of the leading world authorities on these issues. If you want to dig into this in depth, he's got five volumes on the development of these issues. He paraphrases Eutyches this way. I acknowledge that the Lord was from two natures before the union, but after the union, I acknowledge only one nature. Okay, you see how this is moving from Cyril and taking it further than Cyril intended, but causing some problems. This led to a backlash in Constantinople. Probably those who were still kind of annoyed that Nestorius had been treated as shoddily as he had, and they condemn him at what's called the Home Senate in 448. This doesn't bother Eutyches. He calls for support from other churches, convenes another synod at Ephesus in 448. Um, but again, the council is conducted before everyone has time to speak, and Eutyches' doctrine is considered authoritative and orthodox. This synod is not received by the church as authoritative uh, because of a lack of participation by the rest of the church and the fact that it's overturned by Chalcedon. So this has often gone down in history as the robber senate of, of Ephesus. Okay. One of the reasons this was a robber senate is one of the most important theologians of the day who was trying to speak to these issues. His work was sent to the council. Uh, the Senate, but he was not. it was not allowed to be spoken, nor were his representatives given the time to defend their position. And that figure is Leo the Great. Leo the Great was the Bishop of Rome in 440. Uh, we would now call him Pope, but remember, the papacy is not really developed in that way yet. He has, uh, the, he has some authority as the major patriarch of the West, but he is one among many of the five major patriarchs. Leo is himself one of the great theologians of the ancient church on Christology. He wrote this work called The Tome for, uh, to oppose Eutyches at the Robber Senate. However, it was never read out. Um, just to give you a little more background on Leo, he was also a great administrator of Rome. At this time, the emperor's focus on Italy was pretty weak, and there wasn't a lot of imperial interest. And there was a lot of uh, invasions from barbarian tribes at this time, especially from the German. And um, Leo actually negotiated with Attila the Hun to stop him from sacking the city of Rome. So Leo is a quite interesting figure. But in his tome, he rejects Eutychianism, okay, and says that accordingly, while the distinctness of both natures and substances is preserved, and both meet in one person, lowliness is assumed by majesty, weakness by power, mortality by eternity, and in order to pay the debt of our condition, the invaluable nature ha has been united to the passable, so that, as the appropriate remedy for our sins, one and the same, mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, might from one element be capable of dying, and from the other be incapable. Therefore, in the entire and perfect nature of very man was born very God, whole in what was his, whole in what was ours. Okay, so in rejecting Nestorian, or sorry, in rejecting Eutychianism as well as Nestorianism, Leo comes back and says, 
back to this logic of salvation. What must Christ be to save us? He must be fully God and fully man. Eutychianism makes him neither. It makes him something else entirely, this tertium quid. Okay? Weakness must be assumed by power. The divine power must take to himself human weakness without ceasing to be divine. Okay? The inviolable nature, that nature of God that is free from all corruption by creation, any change because he's perfect, takes to himself that nature that can suffer. So in Christ, the impassable God, the God who is beyond all suffering and pain, suffers for us in his humanity, experiences it in a real sense, but without ceasing to be divine. So you see what Leo is doing here. The distinctness must be maintained in the unity in order that all that is God might be connected to all that is us and overcome our sin. So he's still working very clearly with this logic of salvation. So Leo's theology and Leo's pushing will end up winning the day alongside Cyril. They're going to be put next to each other as balances and forming the synthesis. And this occurs at the Council of, Constant of uh, Chalcedon in 451. So, after the Robert Senate had been rejected as insufficient and offering a truncated view of Christ, a new council is called in Chalcedon, which is a smaller town outside Constantinople. The council begins by reaffirming the Nicene Creed and approving both Cyril's second letter from Nestorius that we looked at and Leo's tome. So, it sits these both together. The council then produced a decree that sums up the previous councils, as well as threads the needle between Eutychianism, in which the natures are combined to be a third thing, and Nestorianism, in which they are separated entirely. I want to read this in whole, because um, this is one of the great monuments of Christian theology. And this has been worked out, as we've seen, through 100, 150 years of reflection on how to talk about Christ. Okay, Keep in mind these things. This is why we're talking about this. How is it that the church rightly worships Christ as God? How is it true that he can save us? How is it true that we can rely on him perfectly to restore us? And how is it that we can trust that when we know Christ, we know God the Father? Okay, that's what's at stake here. The very essence of Christianity. This is not a dispute over words. But they're getting at very deep questions of who is Jesus. Okay, So let's see what the council says. They say, Following, therefore, the Holy Fathers, we confess one and the same our Lord Jesus Christ. We all teach harmoniously that he is the same perfect in Godhead, the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with the Father in Godhead, and the same consubstantial with us in manhood, like us in all things except sin, begotten before ages of the Father in Godhead, the same in the last days from for us. And for our salvation, born of Mary the Virgin, Theotokos in manhood, one and the same, Christ, Son, Lord, unique. Okay, so this isn't the whole, this is half the decree. Let's see what they're doing here. Notice how they've summed up all the previous councils. We have the clear statement of homoousios with God, full homoousios with man, rejecting Arianism, rejecting... <clears throat> rejecting Apollinarianism. He has a reasonable soul and a body. Everything that human beings are, he is. Sin only accepting, because that is not that is not natural to us. That is something that's foreign to our nature. So he is perfectly consubstantial in Godhead or divinity. That's just an, old, an older way of saying that. So fully perfect in both. He's begotten before the ages of the Father, this, this eternal relation between Father and Son, in which always father and son with this eternal relation. He is born into this world by the Virgin Mary. Okay, She is Theotokos, according to his humanity. And yet he is one, the same Lord, unique. So we have the summation of all the councils so far. It rejects Arianism. It rejects Apollinarianism. It rejects Nestorianism. And we'll see if it goes on how it rejects Eutychianism and does so in a brilliant way. Just foreshadowing. Okay. So, Christ then is acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The difference of the natures being by no means taken away because of the union, but rather the distinctive character of each nature being preserved, and each combining in one person and hypostasis, not divided or separated into two persons, but one and the same Son 
and only begotten God were the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets of the old and the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us about him, and the symbols of the fathers have handed down to us. Okay, see what they've done here. So they've combined some of this language that's floating around in, in kind of vague terms. So we have Christ who is in two natures, fully God and fully man. And these are united in one hypostasis, one person. So both the appearance and the who are together. How are they united? Well, we can't really say. Notice how they define this. The differences of the natures are not taken away because of the union, but they are preserved. And yet this union is without confusion, without change, therefore no Eutychianism. There's no confusion of the natures, neither is humanity changed into divinity or divinity into humanity. So it's rejecting Eutychianism. Okay? However, at the same time, it is without division or separation, rejecting Nestorianism. So by this negation, we have a twofold thing here. It's defining the terminology very carefully. When we look and think about Christ, there are two answers to the what is he? Okay, what is Christ? He's God. And he's man, completely. So what? He participates purely in divinity, which is unique. He shares with Father and uh, the Father and the Spirit. They are uncreated, infinite, wise, holy, good creator. He is that. But he is also us. He shares in everything that is a human being. So the answer to what is Christ has two answers. Okay, The question, what is Christ, has two answers. However, the who is Christ has a single answer. He is the eternal word. Okay, So that's what's going on here with one hypostasis. The answer to who Christ is, is the word. And the answer to whose humanity is it, is the words. Okay, So the who of Christ is one. But the what of Christ is two. He is both fully God and fully man, united in his person, without confusion, change, division, or separation of the natures. And see where they ground this at the end. They don't do this because they think it is the neatest thing, right? But this is because this is what the prophets of old and the Lord himself taught us about him. They're trying to define who Christ is by careful attention to how scripture talks about Jesus. Who is he? Well, he is God. He is the Word who was in the beginning with God and was God, and yet suffered on the cross for us, and rose again and has a body and has ascended into heaven and will return in that body. He is fully God and fully man, united into one person. How are we supposed to understand this? Well, let's just break it down very clearly. The, the major step here as we move through this council is the understanding of in one person, not from one person. Recall the question before about what was kind of problematic about Cyril, okay? And Eutyches kind of takes this up. If we talk about from one person, that seems to imply that that's no longer the case, right? From seems to indicate motion away from a state. So he remains in one person, and that person unites the two natures in themselves, okay? If you look at Holcomb, he makes a distinction here that might seem a little complicated, but it it's fairly clear, between um, n hypostasia and a hypostasia. So I know I'm getting lots of terms here. What this means, though, is the eternal son already has personal existence. There's already a who there. He takes to himself a human nature, a full human nature, that doesn't have a personal existence. Okay. What that means is there, there is no adopted human person. So there is no Nestorianism. It's not like there's the person of the word and then the person of of the human being and they just kind of come together. No. The person of the eternal word, the son, takes to himself a human nature, everything that makes you, you, and makes it his own. So he is the who. Think about it this way. Think about yourself. You have several different parts, right? You have a mind, you have a body, you have a soul. But in some ways you're not just those things. Because I can ask the question, Whose body is that? Whose soul is that? Whose mind is that? And the answer is you. Right? But in some sense, you're more than just your body, soul, and mind. There's something about them. There's a quality of ownership that you own your body, your soul, your mind. 
Okay? There is U, which is in some ways more than the sum of the parts. It's that that the eternal son takes of his human nature. When we look at the humanity of Christ, we can ask, whose is it? It is the humanity of the eternal word of the Father. Full, complete, mind, body, soul. Anything that is human, he has. And it is his. And it's united because of this quality of ownership, this personal existence. Okay? That might seem like a mystery. And if you are right, it is. The attempt of Chalcedon is not to make sense of the Incarnation. The Incarnation is the greatest mystery of our faith. It is the radical inbreaking of the Creator into the created, who dies for our sins and rises from the dead. We cannot reason that away. We cannot make it fit into a nice box. But we can try to describe it. We can try to avoid errors. And that's what these Chalcedonian adverbs here, without confusion, change, division, or separation, are trying to do. They're drawing a box, saying, these are the things we cannot do. This will compromise Christ in his divinity. This will compromise Christ in his humanity. This will compromise the salvation that we see revealed in the scriptures. So they're trying to be careful to describe accurately what does the word say about Christ and his work for our salvation and his ability to reveal the Father and to redeem us and bring us back to himself. He must be fully God, fully man, in one person so that he can save us. So we might illustrate it this way. Um, again, please take this with a big asterisk. We cannot chart a mystery, right? But we can get some of the terminology down. So Chalcedon, in some ways, gets the best out of both Nestorius and Cyril and brings it to a, a harmonious position. The divine and human natures, by the act of the incarnation, come together in the single hypostasis, which is not produced by this act of incarnation, by the way, but they come together in the hypostasis that unites divinity and humanity. And this is done without confusion of the two, without change of the two, but at the same time without the division or separation of the two, such that he is one Christ in two natures from the moment of incarnation until the end of all history. And that is an amazing thing. And so notice how, uh, I want to step back because I've been giving you lots of terms here, and this is pretty um, intense theology. But this is the church trying to work out its faith. It all goes back to that fundamental pillar of Christianity, that through Christ, God has revealed himself and God has saved his people. Yahweh has come in human form, taken flesh, borne the sins of the world. And he's done this as the Son, who we've found out is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is who Yahweh always was. Unified, perfect, being, love. So when we think about this, this is what it's trying to preserve. The truth of Christ's salvation for us. The truth of who Christ really is. And this is only done properly, understanding the mystery, and we are finite, and we're trying to make sense of this, but also, as all proper theology should do, and we'll see this throughout the, the course, it should end in doxology. The Chalcedonian decree is not made for us to chart out the nature of Christ. It is made so that we know the one we worship, we know the one who has saved us, and we understand how God has loved us. So, Chalcedon should make us sing in praise. And um, I hope it, it always does when I read it. I would suggest read the decree again and just meditate on how amazing our Savior is and how he has made us a way to the Father. Really, really God. There's no intermediary. God became man so that we might know God. Okay. So, step my sermon back here. So what can we learn from this debate between Cyril and Nestorius? In some ways, this brings us to the culmination of what Nicaea started. Okay? By fixing the error that was present in Cyril's position. Two errors have now been avoided. There is no separation of Christ's divine and human natures to the point where the, the union is merely verbal, as would be the case in a Nestorian understanding. Nor is there a combining or mixing of Christ's divinity and humanity in such a way that both are compromised. And we have a Savior who is neither God nor man, but something else entirely, okay, which is not possible by our understanding of God and creation. So, in some ways, 
Chalcedon brought an end to the Christological controversy, at least in the Roman Empire. So let's briefly discuss the aftermath of Chalcedon. While the Chalcedonian decree should be seen as a theological triumph, and I think it truly is, there has been no better attempt to express the nature of Christ than Chalcedon. It did produce something lamentable. There was a schism that was produced by this. If we think back, um, not all the councils were immediately recognized. Um, Nicaea took 60 years of debate and fighting before it was fully embraced by the rest of the church. The decree of Chalcedon brought pretty much a rapid end to the debate over Christology within the Roman Empire itself and beyond its bounds to the west and the north. Although there wouldn't be need for further clarification at the Second Council of Constantinople uh, in 553 regarding the two wills of Christ. Um, I'm going to leave that aside for the moment. However, it would cause schism with the churches of the East. Recall after Ephesus, churches in the Persian Empire and in in Syria, the Syriac churches, rejected uh, Ephesus because it, it condemned Nestorius. They didn't think Chalcedon went far enough to, to bring him back. And so there was a split between the Chalcedonian church, what we call the Orthodox church, and the Nestorians or the church of the East who would flourish beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire into Persia and beyond. We'll talk about them a little bit next lecture. They were uh, a great missionary church and it is very unfortunate that these two churches were not be able to join. On the other side, many churches saw the council as giving too much to the Nestorian side and wanted to maintain the from two natures understanding of Cyril. These churches are often called the Monophysites or Miaphysites for one nature, just as we kind of saw Eutyches have, or the Jacobin Church from one of their early organizers. So what are we to make of this? Nicaea, which is a theological masterpiece, and Noel even mentions that in the book, um, was not readily accepted, and there are reasons for this. This was seen as too connected to the imperial church, and those beyond the realms of imperial power thought it as an imposition upon them. Uh, there is human stubbornness and sin. These things were not exercised in an upright manner. Cyril pushed his Christology in improper ways. He manipulated councils. He stacked the deck. And even if he was right, that was inappropriate, and it caused harm and hurt to the church. This represents the first major schism within Christianity between the Chalcedonian Church, which is Eastern Orthodoxy, Rome, and all Protestantism, pretty much, and the churches of the East, the Monophysites, and the Nestorians, who split in different ways. This is a tragic thing, and it is to be lamented. Um, but that does not mean that the theology of, nice, of Chalcedon was not correct. Um, and there has been work on dialogue. Most of these divisions do seem to be that of language. Nobody is really trying to violate Chalcedon, um, but some logical implications do move that direction. But I want you to see, um, as we've moved through this discussion, we've covered a lot of ground, but it has had a logical flow because Cal Chalcedon uh, provides the logical conclusion of all the previous councils beginning with Nicaea, which rejected Arius, who rejected that Christ was divine. The council said he is homoousios with the Father, truly divine. People pushed the other way, and they, Constantinople said, no, 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 he is homoousios with us as well. Christ is truly human. Ephesus said, Christ's two natures are not separated. But Chalcedon says, neither are they blurred or mingled. Therefore, we get to this culmination of two natures in one person, neither separated nor merged. And with this, we can update our road of Nicene Orthodoxy. In some, th in some ways, what happened with Chalcedon was a narrowing of the roads and showing the ditches that proceed further on. So now we not only have the ditch of compromising divinity, with adoptionism and Arianism, or the ditch of compromising his humanity with Apollinarianism and Doceticism. But Chalcedonian orthodoxy narrows us down that we have a true human nature and a true divine nature united in a single person. So we have the ditch of compromising the distinction of the natures, Eutychianism, or the ditch of compromising the unity of the natures, Nestorianism, 
So this is trying to set us in how can we rightly follow and know Christ? How can we properly confess the one who saved us? How can he truly come and be our Lord and Savior, revealing the Father and bringing us back to himself? So I hope you've learned something today about all the Christological controversies, how the church has developed and uh, from this early period of persecution through to about the 5th century. We'll pick up some of this story next time, seeing how does the church develop after the fall of the um, western part of the Roman Empire. We'll look at the fall of Rome, and specifically some discussions of Augustine, one of the greatest theologians of the early church. We'll look at the rise of monasticism, which has been going on through this period, but it's kind of a different story. And we'll move into the early medieval period, looking at the church of the, Cal uh, the court of Charlemagne as it develops in what will become Western Europe. So I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good day.